I think one of the things that motivates everyone participating in the IPFS ecosystem is the idea that we can have a fabric for knowledge for all the applications we depend upon for this internet where especially today, we're having all of our communication, collaboration, our work, our play, our social lives, it's all happening in the internet. The reason we landed on IPFS is first and foremost, content addressing, right? So instead of addressing data by where it is, you can address data by what it is. It's, it allows content to be immutable, uh, to know that it hasn't changed. and The data that you're working with is really what you're expecting it to be. And that provides a lot of security guarantees. And the IPFS project is just like a fantastic implementation of content addressing in a way that is pretty is, is accessible to developers. IPFS 0.5 is the largest release we've made to go IPFS in years. So a ton of exciting improvements are landing here. We've actually upgraded pretty much the entire life cycle of data in uh, the IPFS network from adding data to IPFS to providing it to the network, sharing what data you have um, to finding the data you're looking for in order to load a website or view an image, and then actually fetching that information from peers in the network. There's a massive amount of improvements that are going into this release that users and the community have been requesting to decentralize the way that they store information in the world, right? So seeing these problems appear in a live network is, in, is, is amazing. And having to tackle them and having to like engineer for these new heights of scale is a, definitely a, an adventure. In diagnosing where, where the improvements needed to happen, we did a lot of um, both network research, like spelunking into where, where bottlenecks and pain points were with the current network and talking to a lot of our community members. So we at Protocol Labs, we like to think ourselves as an engineering back organization. All the decisions that we make uh, ideally would be rooted in data and would be rooted in scientific discoveries that we then translate into our projects. We didn't want to have the cycle of like guessing and checking where like we guess at something, we implement change, we cut a release, we ship it to everyone, and then we're saying, well, to make it better, to make it worse. So TestGround is a, uh, a tool for testing decentralized systems. The point is to be able to simulate a network. So we have realistic network conditions. We'll have to like simulate any network we need uh, and then start testing our software system on it without having to actually like have that network exist in reality. In the past, what happens, like everyone would start their nodes up, they would join the network, and they would say, I am like, like, please make a request to me. I am like a DHT server. I was like, I, I'm, I'm responding to requests. The problem is many of these nodes were behind NATs or other firewalls. So you couldn't actually dial them or like, like other nodes couldn't connect into you. So we've made some changes in this release such that like uh, when you start up the DHT, uh, it starts in client mode. So the goal here is to ensure that like the DHT is mostly composed of nodes that are actually reachable, which means that now when you try to query the DHT, you're not going to be like going around like trying to talk to a bunch of nodes that are not going to respond to you. We've uh, cleared out the bad nodes. We've reset the structure. We can now build the algorithm in a sense like correctly. There are like there are two major components. One is how you learn about other people on the network. This is called the routing table. It helps route you from place to place. Uh, the second is the lookup algorithm, which helps you figure out, given that I'm looking for some piece of information, what questions do I need to ask next in order to get where I'm going? The shift to zero point five for me, the, the the like banner feature that I'm the most excited about is the improvement to the bit swap algorithm. With the new bit swap, people who are using IPFS can expect to get faster transfer speeds and less duplicate information coming across their network. We've added a new message type. So with this new message type, instead we can now ask all of our peers if they have a particular uh, a particular block, and those that have it can say yes, and those that don't have it can say no. So with IPNS over PubSub, you can basically join a group and say, you know, I want to find, I, I care about the updates to this. Has anyone heard any updates? And they'll just push them to you as soon as they receive them. Adding more reliability uh, to IPNS over PubSub means that people can build tools using IPNS that are expected to have frequent updates. What we introduce in Go IPFS 0.5 is a native support for subdomains. So uh, now you don't need to 
tinker with your reverse proxy configuration, your Nginx or Apache or whatever you are running there, uh, you just set uh, a single configuration option in Go IPFS. You define that I want to run a subdomain for this domain, and it will support it out of the box. The main improvement in 0.5 around subdomain gateways is the fact that they work on local gateways. This means our browser extension, IPFS Companion, can redirect any IPFS resource or IPNS DNS link website to a local gateway. I'd say from where we were a year ago, the network has really leveled up in terms of reliability, performance, um, and capability. Um, there's a, a lot of new use cases that are empowered with IPFS, and there's a lot of new stuff coming in just the next couple of months that I think are going to open up a ton of new businesses. For us, the, the upgrade cycle has gotten a lot easier as a number of interfaces have really stabilized. Um, it seems like IPFS is finding its footing and really starting to understand what it is and what it isn't, uh, which is a really useful thing when you're trying to build on top of it. It means that the upgrade process isn't sort of bringing these sort of dramatic swings in the way things behave uh, as much as they were before. And when they do change, we now get a much more uh, sort of storied understanding of why. A more stable IPFS, you know, that means that providers like us that are building on the protocol can really provide a better service to our users. And when our users have a better user experience, that allows more people to come into the IPFS ecosystem and, you know, everybody wins there. I think we're going to see pretty much every major browser is going to be supporting IPFS. What kind of apps and experiences can we expect to see in the next two, three, five years that you couldn't have had last year? Decentralized web native applications. That's what's exciting. And I think, you know, now that we have that infrastructure layer and we're seeing that sort of next level of tool building, you know, the growth there is exponential. I think the question to ask is, which sort of world do you want to live in? Do you want to live in a world where we have some of these major league problems of understanding the flow of information, of information and ownership of information? And can we as people who build things sort of affect that in a positive way? Decentralization is not the only answer to that and building on top of IPFS is not the only answer to that, but it is certainly one of them. And it is one of the more robust answers to that. And it's starting to become a viable alternative to a classic centralized web stack, uh, which given how difficult some of the technical challenges of doing things in a decentralized manner are, that's incredible. And that's the world I want to live in.